Hello to whoever's watching out there. I'm Kay Bradfield from Perth Zoo and I'm going to be presenting the first half of this talk about recovering the white-bellied frog, Geocrinia alba, in southwest Western Australia. Then I'll hand over to Kim Williams from the WA Parks and Wildlife Service, who's also the chair of the WA Threatened Frog Recovery Team, for the second half. I thought I'd start with a quick look at threatened frogs in WA. We're actually really fortunate. 85 species of frogs are known to occur in the state, but only three of them are currently recognised as threatened. All three of these are endemic to the southwest of the state, and two of them are closely related to one another, and they're both only found in the Margaret River region. It's about 300 kilometres south of Perth, roughly where the small grey dot in the bottom left corner of the map is. Uh, these are the white-bellied and orange-bellied frogs. They look very similar, but there's a significant level of genetic divergence between them. And the white-bellied frog is critically endangered while the orange-bellied frog is vulnerable. The third threatened species in the state is the sunset frog. They're only found in a small area on the south coast. Uh, again, small gray dot on the map. And they're currently classed as vulnerable. We've worked with all three of these threatened species at Perth Zoo, but we're focusing this talk on white-bellied frogs because they're the critically endangered species, so they're the major focus for conservation efforts. A little bit about white-bellied frogs, uh, they're quite small. They reach a maximum snout vent length of approximately 25 millimetres, and metamorphs are tiny. Uh, they're about five millimetres long, and they only weigh approximately 0.03 of a gram. Uh, which is the same as a single rice bubble or rice crispy if you know the cereal. They're habitat specialists. They live in swampy seepages along small creeks. The two threatened geocrinia species have neighbouring distributions and similar habitat requirements, but white-bellied frogs occur below 80 metres, while orange-bellied frogs are found above 120 metres. The drainage lines they occupy are quite extensive in the Margaret River region, but the frogs aren't found throughout them. It looks like they're restricted to small sites along drainage lines by how much moisture is present throughout the year and by appropriate substrate composition. Because they've got very specific habitat requirements, they've got a naturally fragmented distribution. A bit about their breeding biology. They breed in spring, which is September to November in the Southern Hemisphere. Males dig shallow burrows and call from within the burrow. When a female chooses a male to breed with, they mate in the burrow and then they both leave. The male will dig a new burrow a short distance away and start the whole process all over again. Neither parent will go back to the previous burrow. There's no parental care in this species. The largest recorded clutch size is 26, but most clutches are substantially smaller. They're usually only 10 to 12 eggs. The eggs hatch, but they don't have typical free swimming feeding tadpoles. Instead, the larvae are endotrophic, so they have yolk sacs, and they remain within the burrow until they metamorphose, which takes approximately two months from the time they were laid. The juvenile stage is quite long. They take two to three years to reach sexual maturity. And their early life history stages have quite high mortality. Eggs and larvae only have about a 20% chance of surviving to metamorphosis, largely due to predation by invertebrates and fungal infections. Their maximum known lifespan in the wild is six years, but adult mortality is also high. They have some of the lowest adult survival rates known for frogs, and many only survive long enough to breed in a single year. One study found that 95% of adult male frogs move less than five meters between seasons within a year and no more than 20 meters between years. This means that the potential for dispersal, and hence gene flow, between populations is likely to be very low. And this is backed up by genetic studies that found very large differences across the species range, particularly given that the populations aren't very far apart. Even populations that are only a couple of kilometers apart can be genetically distinct, and the current levels of gene flow appear to be approaching zero. It also means that there's little capacity for populations that go locally extinct due to fire or another disaster, a failed wet season, or just stochastic variation to reestablish by natural means. So just a quick look at the major threats facing them. 
I don't think there's anything particularly startling on this list from a threats to frogs point of view. Climate change is in red because it's a serious issue going forwards. Southwest WA has been assessed as being particularly vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Rainfalls already decreased by approximately 20% and the temperatures increased by about a degree Celsius uh, over the last few decades. And the future trend is predicted to be continued warming and a higher probability of decreased winter rainfall, which can obviously adversely impact frogs in a number of ways. Disease is in grey because we know that the amphibian chytrid fungus is present in white-bellied frog populations and it's likely to be throughout the region. Despite this, there's no evidence that it is having or has had any significant impact on the species. That said, we do still employ best practice measures, both at the zoo and in the field, to minimise the chance of transferring the amphibian chytrid or any other disease amongst populations. White-bellied frogs are classed as critically endangered because they meet several of the relevant IUCN red list criteria. Their distribution covers approximately 130 square kilometres, but the area of occupancy within that is much smaller. It's less than two square kilometres, and their distribution is severely fragmented. Up to 70% of potentially suitable riparian vegetation has already been cleared within their range, and then you've got to take into account that they're restricted to sites that are rare even within the riparian zone. There's a continuing decline in the area of occupancy, the area extent and quality of habitat, the number of subpopulations, and the total number of mature individuals. So there are 117 monitoring sites for white-bellied frogs, which cover all known populations, but 62 of these are now considered to be extinct. And that means that no males have been heard calling for at least four consecutive years at those sites. In addition, approximately 77% of the area of occupancy and more than half of the remaining populations of white-bellied frogs are on privately owned land. And irrespective of land tenure, 35 of the remaining 55 populations, so almost two thirds, are estimated to have no more than 20 calling males or 40 adults. So looking at recovery efforts to date and the role Perth Zoo has played. The first recovery plan for Geocrinia was developed in the mid 90s and it recognized the importance of establishing new populations to conservation efforts. Four methods of doing this were identified, but right off the bat, the wild wild translocation of adults wasn't considered to be an ideal option. The relatively small size of even the larger white-bellied frog populations means that removing enough adults to start a new population would have an adverse impact on the source population or populations. The next option was the wild-wild translocation of eggs and larvae, and Parks and Wildlife did conduct trial translocations of orange-bellied frog clutches in 2000. They used orange-bellied frogs to start with because clutches could be removed with minimal risk to the source populations because they're relatively large compared to white-bellied frog populations. Unfortunately, survival to maturity was low and only a few adults have persisted at the translocation sites in the longer term. It's possible that the outcome would have been different or would be different with white-bellied frogs, but the small size of most white-bellied populations means that it would be difficult to relocate enough clutches to start a population without adversely impacting the source populations. Uh, so it's really not a strategy you'd pursue unless you were confident it would be successful. So this left the two captive options. A successful captive breeding program had previously been established in New Zealand for the carry frog, Geocrinia rosea. This is a closely related species that has similar breeding biology to white and orange bellied frogs, but it has a greater distribution and it's a common species. Given the situation white bellied frogs were in, initial breeding trials at Perth Zoo focused on carry frogs as well and those started in 2006. Uh, staff had success quite quickly, uh, and following on from this, the program switched focus to orange-bellied frogs, 
because they're more closely related to white-bellied but less threatened. Unfortunately, the techniques that worked with Kerry frogs didn't work with orange-bellied or white-bellied frogs. With hindsight, this isn't necessarily surprising since the threatened species have much more specific habitat requirements than the more widespread species. Captive breeding may still be a viable option for white-bellied and orange-bellied frogs, but more research is required. One thing I think it's worth noting here is that despite the fact white-bellied frogs are critically endangered, we're actually rather lucky because, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the amphibian chytrid doesn't seem to be a problem for them, so it means that we don't have to have a captive breeding program. And that leads to the fourth option, which is the head starting or captive rearing of eggs and larvae that were laid in the wild to increase survival through those particularly vulnerable stages of their life history before releasing them back to the wild. We already had an indication that head starting should work because as part of the project up to that point, individuals of both threatened species had been successfully maintained in captivity and juveniles had been successfully re reared to maturity. So at that point, the primary focus of the program at Perth Zoo switched to head starting. Each year, Parks and Wildlife identifies an appropriate source population or source populations for us, and we, Perth Zoo staff, do a series of trips down to Margaret River in spring to collect up to 10 clutches of eggs or tadpoles to bring back to the zoo. This is pretty labor intensive given that you've got to identify male territories based on calling and then carefully search the territories for burrows that contain eggs or larvae. Um, something to note about clutch selection. I mentioned earlier that after mating, a male will dig a new burrow and continue calling. So they can potentially end up with several clutches in their territory. So when we're collecting clutches, we only take one clutch from each male territory to minimize the chances of collecting closely related clutches. Um, back at the zoo, we rear them for the next 10 to 11 months before releasing them back to the wild the following spring. This is a really successful strategy for white-bellied frogs. We consistently have 96 to 98% survival from the time we bring them to the zoo through until release which is approximately five times higher than in the wild. And maybe even higher, given our survival rate includes those first eight to 10 months post metamorphosis, but we don't know how many survive that period in the wild. This means that we can release 20% or so of each clutch back to the source population, the population it came from, to minimize any adverse impacts of clutch collection on that population and still have quite a lot of animals that can be used to supplement existing small populations or to establish new ones. Over the last 10 years, we've released more than 900 white-bellied frogs to a number of sites in the wild, both to establish or re-establish populations and to augment existing ones. Overall, the released and augmented populations are doing really well, but there are one or two exceptions. Kim's going to talk more about the post-release monitoring shortly, but those exceptions are likely to be due to the reduction in rainfall in recent decades and the drying effect this is having on creek systems in the region. This really highlights the biggest issue with this program at the moment, which is the identification of appropriate release sites, by which I mean sites that are likely to not only be suitable now, but to remain suitable into the future. The good news is that a PhD student is currently working in collaboration with both Parks and Wildlife and Perth Zoo to determine how to identify these sites. Before I hand over to Kim, there's just a couple of other things that I thought might be worth mentioning. Despite the fact the two Geocrinia species are so closely related and that the same husbandry techniques work successfully with adults of both species, Orange-bellied metamorphs and juveniles seem to be more sensitive to have narrower tolerance limits than white-bellied metamorphs and juveniles for several parameters. Orange-bellied frogs do have a more restricted distribution, and as I mentioned earlier, they're found at higher elevations. So maybe this isn't really surprising, 
but it does highlight the fact that even closely related species that are similar in size, appearance, behavior, habitat, can differ in ways that affect their husbandry requirements. In this case, we developed initial protocols that facilitated very high survival post-metamorphosis for white-bellied frogs, but the orange-bellied frogs had markedly lower survival in the early years. We identified the likely causes, we adjusted our husbandry protocols for both species, and the survival rate of the orange-bellied mets and juveniles increased to almost 100% as well, and it stayed there over the last few years without any change to the survival rate of the white-bellied frogs. Also, while it's not the primary focus of the program, we did see value in trying to determine how to reliably breed this species in captivity, because the situation in the wild could change in future and breeding may become more important, or captive breeding may become more important to the conservation of the species. So over the last decade, we've kept a small number of breeding pairs to trial different breeding and closure setups and potential ways of priming or triggering animals to breed. While females usually become gravid and males usually dig burrows and call, we've only bred them successfully in two years, 2011 and 2016, in two quite different breeding chamber designs. Perth has annual lower rainfall than Margaret River to begin with, and we've experienced a number of drier than average years over the last 10 years or so. So it may be that the, the trigger for females to lay eggs is something associated with the quality of the wet season, the number, timing, and or intensity of low pressure systems during winter or spring, the amount of rain in a particular month or months, etc. And that that particular criterion is only met in some years in Perth. But whatever the cause, we're running out of options to try with our existing facilities. So we're looking at transferring the frogs to Margaret River, where parks and wildlife staff would oversee attempting to breed them down there using the same husbandry protocols and breeding chamber that we've been using for the last few years and had success with in 2016. This should help us work out whether or not the drier climate in Perth is the issue. Right, so now I will hand over to Kim. Thank you very much. This is part two of the presentation, recovering the white-bellied and orange-bellied frogs in southwest Western Australia. There are three species of threatened frog known to occur in the southern portions of Western Australia. Two are Geocrinia species. One is the Spicospina species. The two Geocrinia species, as depicted by the green polygons, occur in an area south of Margaret River in the far southwest corner of Western Australia. The white-bellied frog, Geocrinia alba, is classed as critically endangered. It has a distinctive white underbelly. The photo in the frog in this photo is a full-size adult. The orange-bellied frog Geocrinia vitellina is classed as vulnerable. It has distinctive orange underbelly. Both species of frog were only new to science in 1983 and have subsequently been the focus of intensive recovery actions through a geocrinia recovery team and various recovery plans. Both species have an unusual breeding biology known as direct development. The male, as depicted in the top left-hand photo, creates a small burrow 20 to 30 millimeters deep, calls from the burrow during the breeding season from September through to November. If successful in attracting a female, eggs are deposited into the burrow. The eggs are fertilized and both adults move off to repeat the process in another location. The far right hand top picture shows two burrows with their tops exposed, showing the eggs and the tadpoles in the burrows. Tadpoles, as depicted in the bottom right photo, remain and spend their entire life in the egg. There is no freeze in the burrow, sorry, there's no free swimming tadpole stage, 
and they receive all the nutrient they require from the egg mass and the egg jelly when laid. They stay in the burrow until they metamorphose into small froglets, as shown in the top in the bottom left photo. These froglets then climb out of the burrow to establish their own territories. The habitat of both species is very similar, being primarily linear riparian habitat with dense sedge beds, some overstory of secondary species up to about three meters high. Um, these photos depict typical habitat for both species, showing the location of the frog and burrows on the ground in the organic material. Both species um, <clears throat> are separated by only approximately six kilometer distance, yet we can see from this topography and the contour map that there is very little difference in topography between the occurrences. So what has caused or what has been the factor involved in creating the speciation for these two is unknown. Other things obvious from this map are, is that the area of occupancy for Geocrinia alba, the white belly frog, is much larger than the orange belly frog Geocrinia vitellina. Geocrinia alba occurs in a mixture of conservation lands and private lands. Those private lands are generally under agricultural use, ranging from dairy cattle, beef cattle, horticulture, viticulture, tree plantations, and small lifestyle blocks. As a consequence, much of the habitat has been modified and the riparian and drainage systems change, thus the critically endangered ranking for the species. In contrast, the orange bellied frog occurs entirely in conservation lands, such as National Park, with no disturbance or land clearing associated within any of its surface water catchments. Uh, however, the numbers of creek systems that the orange bellied occur in is very small. In recent years, three new populations of Geogrinia vitellina have been discovered in situations in the habitat unlike the normal habitat. So small basin populations, as we've referred to them, areas with very limited surface water catchment have now been found to contain some geocrinia populations. These populations, as depicted by the yellow polygon, can be very small. This one in this image occupies approximately 100 square meters. It is likely that this population has persisted with very little <clears throat> movement and uh, genetic flow to other populations for many thousands of years. The Geocrinia recovery team, through its various recovery plans, has adopted three translocation strategies for these species. Translocations being the reintroduction of captive reared metamorphs back into extinct but previously occupied habitat with the aim of establishing viable occurrences across its former range if the habitat remains suitable. Team has also undertaken introductions or the introduction of either egg masses collected from the wild or captive reared metamorphs into habitat that was never known to contain geocrinia populations but with the aim of establishing additional insurance populations should a large-scale catastrophic event such as a bushfire impact on their natural occurrences. This strategy particularly applies to the orange-bellied frog Geocrinia vitellina with its very small natural distribution and range. The third approach to translocations has been augmentation, where the collection of egg masses and subsequent release of captive reared metamorphs sourced from the same site to boost resilience and increase the breeding capacity of the current population. <coughs> Since the year 2000, um, various translocations of the various types have been undertaken. This table shows that eight white belly frog geocrinia alpha translocations have occurred and that 11 orange bellied frog Geocrinia vitellina translocations have occurred. You'll note that for the vitellina, 
the initial approach was introductions via translocation of egg masses from the wild. This subsequently proved to be not very successful or efficient and resulted in a high loss of eggs and or metamorphs. So the team moved to the captive rearing and relocation of one-year-old metamorphs as undertaken by the Perth Zoo. Uh, that metamorph work commenced in 2010. There are six monitoring techniques used to address the varying needs and requirements of both the natural and translocated populations and their subsequent management. I'll go through these six types and the reasons for and how they are applied. <coughs> Number one, the point count monitoring technique. This applies to all sites and is essentially assigning a categorical classification based on the number of calling males identified from a fixed and standardized position on the outside edge of occupied habitat. The purpose of this monitoring is that it detects presence absence and or significant changes in the population size between years. This technique can be implemented by one person. Technique number two is a paired transect. This is applied to a subset of populations with medium to large numbers of calling males. Paired transects, five metres apart and extending for 20 metres length, are located within occupied habitat. The task is to count all calling frogs between the two transect clients. This requires two people. Monitoring technique number three is a lineal transect. <coughs> this is specifically designed for populations with the largest point count categorical ratings. The idea is to provide a greater insight into these conservation significant populations. That it particularly applies to some of the unique habitat criteria and attributes of geocrinia populations in that they occur in very narrow streamlined habitat. This technique works where the streamlined habitat five meters or less in width. The technique requires locating the first calling frog in the headwaters of the stream, field mark and GPS its position. You then move downstream via the stream channel, counting every individual calling frog along the length of the stream or until a 50 meter gap with no calling animals or a barrier such as a road, a culvert, a drain intersects the stream. The last calling frog position is GPSed. This technique requires two people to provide maximum efficiency and accuracy. This provides a population density measure and a length of occupied habitat to compare between years. The fourth technique is population extents. Locate the position of the first and the last calling individuals within a population. You can combine this with the point count results to identify any shift in the area of habitat occupied, particularly applicable to reduced rainfall and climate change conditions. The fifth technique, which is applied to translocated and introduced populations, is a population census. So animals, when they are released, the metamorphs are released in the wild, are released in batches of 10 to 20, in an approximately two meter radius around a central point marked with a field peg. There may be multiple release point pegs established based on the availability of the habitat at the release site and the numbers of frogs to be released. The exact release location, i.e. create a 20 mil artificially created burrow or depression in the ground and place an individual animal into it, these are marked with flagging tape at ground level. In subsequent years, you come back to do the monitoring, you can locate and number the position of all calling males to within an accuracy of 30 centimetres. You reference these positions against the release peg locations to compare with the numbers and locations of animals actually released. As in previous techniques, GPS the first and last calling individuals. This technique is best applied with two people to help locate accurately the position of each individual calling animal. 
This technique is used to evaluate the success of the exact location and the characteristics of the chosen release location, i.e. did you place the artificial burrow in the correct spot? and it provides an accurate assessment of the population size and the area of habitat occupied for, through the translocated site. The final technique is the confirmation of breeding. So when translocated animals reach breeding age, for geocrinian species, usually between three and four years of age, you locate the individual burrows of a subset of the calling males, you field mark those burrow sites, return back to those in a few days to a week and check to see whether they have successfully attracted a female and an egg mass is in those burrows. Using these types of monitoring data <clears throat> you can determine the population status. So this plan, this map shows a categorical rating using the point count data. It shows the distribution of white-bellied frogs and orange-bellied frogs and what population size each of those occurrences are. The white crosses mark extinct sites. We have a protocol for confirmation of extinction which requires four consecutive years under the correct conditions during the breeding season of no calling recorded at the site. The distribution of the dots and the colours reflect the population size as seen in the legend. You will note the best, as in the largest number of individuals in a population, are marked with green dots. There are not many green dots for Geocrinia alba. There are generally more for Geocrinia vitellina. The point count data can also be used to have a look at the distribution and demography of the various categorical groups. So this chart shows that Geocrinia alba in pale blue, Geocrinia vitellina in orange. We can see here that <coughs> um, <coughs> at least 25% of the Geocrinia alba sites have become extinct when this chart was produced a few years ago and there was another 35 plus percent with less than five calling animals. Subsequent to this chart, in recent counts and assessments, over 50% of the total number of Geocrinia alba populations have become extinct since 1983. In contrast, no Geocrinia vitellina sites have become extinct, and the majority of them are in the 10 to 20 and 20 plus calling male size. Similar approach can be applied to look at the categorical groupings and the type of tenure and land that these populations occur on. Again, we can see in the extinct category <coughs> that though some Geocrinia alba populations on conservation lands have become extinct, approximately six, the majority of the extinct populations have occurred on private lands. Ditto, the majority of the Geocrinia vitellina populations occur on conservation lands, or all of them occur on conservation lands, and these are generally fared better than those on private lands. The population extent monitoring <coughs> technique provides information such as depicted in this photo. The red lines depict the start and stop points for each of the populations occurring in these creek systems. Repeated over a number of years, you can detect the changes in the occupancy up and down the creek systems if, in particular, there is a drying climate and the headwaters of the creeks become drier, the populations you hope will move down and follow the water. We have detected these movements, small movements of 20 to 40 metres over a 10 year period for some of these species. The lineal count monitoring provides a more detailed look at the populations in particular sites. So this chart shows three lineal count populations for Geocrinia alba over a period from 1999 to 2019, so a 20-year period. You can see that the density have fluctuated, but in general have been increasing over time. 
So these are determined by the lineal length of the between the first and last calling frog and the numbers of frogs counted across that transect. The site 37D with the pink squares is broader than 5 metres and fluctuates and thus we get fluctuations in the numbers of frogs occurring in there depending on the rainfall and the flooding events that might occur. Linked to the lineal count monitoring is the variations in the extent occupied by the populations and it can be seen that over a 20 year period most of the populations remain fairly static with not a lot of variation in extent uh, although there, has, there is some often associated with annual rainfall and soil moisture. A translocation results are derived using the population census monitoring techniques. This has been applied for a number of our introduced sites, so sites where the species was never known to occur. This site is geocrinia, this chart is a geocrinia output site known as 42B. You can see that metamorphs were initially released in 2010 with 70 individuals, animals. Again, topped up in 2011 with 31 animals and 2012 with 44 animals. And this, that's the red bars. The blue bars show the numbers of calling males that have been recorded subsequent to those releases. Just remind you that the red bars include males and females, the total number of animals. The blue bars are only recordings of males. In this instance, we can see that with an initial top up of approximately 140 animals, the population of calling males has stabilized at around the 55 to 60 mark. Um, the sex ratio in the wild is believed to be a one to one. So these populations are now around 100 plus animals. This makes it some of the most robust and best populations that we have for this species. Another Geocrinia alba introduction site is site 102. Uh, this commenced in 2014 with the release of 147 metamorphs, topped up again with 60 metamorphs in 2015. And then subsequent monitoring has shown that this has been increasing, although slowly. The current year, 2019, we recorded 42 calling males and therefore a population of approximately 85 animals in total. We think that this population will continue to increase because over this period of five years, there have been periods of very dry and quite moist. So it's covered a range of conditions at the site and then they have survived. For Geocrinia vitellina, <coughs> we have introduced a number of populations away from their natural occurrence into the adjoining creek systems. We commenced this work in the year 2000 using egg nest, egg mass translocations. Uh, and we can see from 2000 to 2010, although animals did survive and persist at these sites, the population numbers were very small. In 2010, we made the decision to put a small number of metamorphs in there. Sorry, 2011. Repeated that in 2013 to see whether that would make some change. If you look there for three years later at 2016, we got our highest numbers recorded. So they, we believe, are a contribution from the metamorph releases from 2011 and 2013. The population has been slowly declining a bit, so we've made the decision to introduce 25 metamorphs this year to see if we can get them over a particular threshold to improve their viability and survivability. Similarly, for Geocrinia vitellina site 7b, this initially started as an egg mass translocation in the year 2000. Uh, that persisted but did not do well. Um, and a similar story occurred. <coughs> the Geocrinia alba, we have actually done some translocations, so putting animals back into formerly extinct sites. This is, Ge this is site 42A, which for many years uh, had no calling frogs. They went extinct back in about 2009. 
for reasons unknown. In 2017, <clears throat> two individuals occurred. These are probably animals that moved upstream from our 42B site, approximately 300 metres away upstream. This is a very unusual movement for such a small frog. We then took the opportunity to augment this site with 40 metamorphs that were captive reared, and we've commenced the monitoring process. We can see that from that 40, 20 of those would be represented as males. We so far have only had around nine or 10 calling animals. The prognosis and issues for the white-bellied and orange-bellied frog. We believe despite some of the successes of the translocation and introductions, there will be continued decline of a number of the natural populations, particularly those with less than 10 calling animals. Land use intensification in the area and particularly water use, the creation of dams and irrigation projects will further increase threats to the remaining habitats. The translocation via the captive rearing and breeding for release program has been promising but is not always successful. We need to improve our site selection process to give the translocated animals a maximum chance of surviving. We have a current PhD student looking at details of site selection and various hydrological issues to, to improve our site selection process for releases. There could also come a time when our water management authorities will be required to release water into the natural systems away from irrigated processes to maintain the water levels at a number of our sites. For the orange belly frog, <coughs> the populations are generally stable, uh, but we have now in the last two years detected, detected a decline in two sites as a result of drying habitat and reduced rainfall. The threats from large-scale fires and large-scale groundwater abstraction, which could impact on this species. The forested areas and the conservation reserves in which these white orange belly frogs occur are increasingly being used for recreational use and protecting the, the habitat from recreational use, such as four-wheel drives, motorbikes, and firewood cutting is becoming an ongoing issue. We have attempted to establish a population south of the Blackwood River. All existing populations occur north of the river. This is to try and encourage or create an insurance population in case of a large scale fire. Similarly, it may be that in future with a drying climate, we might have to have a fallback position that some populations get artificial watering, others don't. That concludes this part two presentation. Thank you for your interest and listening.